Good day and welcome back to the 4040 podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley, as usual. Today I have a very, very special episode. As always, I am talking to Dr. Megan Neff, all about autism and PTSD. For those of you who don't know Megan and her work, Megan is a clinical psychologist who produces a lot of work over on Instagram. One thing that I'd really love to highlight about Megan's work is the amazing Venn diagram graphs that she does. She gets like different diagnose, diagnoses, different neurodivergencies, and sort of compares and contrasts the overlap. So today, we're go- as I said, we're going to talk about PTSD. But before we do that, uh, Megan, would you like to tell us a little bit more about uh, what you do? Yeah, yeah. So I, you summarized it really well. I'm a clinical psychologist in private practice in the States, in Oregon. Mm-hmm. And I specialize working with neurodivergent adults, to mostly late in life identified and diagnosed adults. I also do neurodivergent affirming assessments. And then, so I do that about half time and then half time I do really content creation where mm. I, I think visually. So I love making infographics and turning these really complex ideas into visual pixels. Mm-hmm. So and that is kind of my special interest. It's what recharges me. So I feel really lucky that I get to do that pretty much yeah. half time. Get the yeah. both the both of the, the dough of best worlds. <laughs> the yeah. both of best yes. worlds. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I was just gonna say I, I'm autistic ADHD myself. I forgot mm. to mention that. And as an ADHD, I've noticed I have to have a lot of different projects I do in a given week to keep mm. my brain engaged. So that's part of why my work is structured with kind of assessments, clients, content creating. Structured with variety. Yes, the yeah. autistic ADHD way. I'm actually thinking, uh, I've actually been uh, forwarded for a, an assessment for, for ADHD or ADD, something mm-hmm. like that, because executive functioning for me is such a massive part. And uh-huh. I've always quite str- like struggled quite a lot with my focus, but mm-hmm. it's it's only like, for certain certain things like I found yeah. I could focus really really easily on on certain things that I enjoyed but as soon as I stopped enjoying them the focus went away and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I kind of talked to my mum about it because she she's a special needs teacher and she's she's gone quite high up in and stuff and she works with a lot of ADHD and autistic children and I think my reservations about going for a diagnosis was mostly because of my presentation, because I'm quite mm-hmm. slow mm-hmm. with how I think and feel. And mm-hmm. so we're, we're, I'm kind of I'm kind of on the fence about whether, whether I am or not. Um, <laughs> you know, I, it presents really differently. I so it, it's interesting because. I t- typically think it's easier for people to embrace their ADHD than their autism, but I'm finding like for me, it was opposite with autism. It was like, Oh yes, this, this fits, this makes sense. The ADHD I, I saw after the autism mm-hmm. and it was harder to see because I, I live in hyperfixation. like my highest, you know, those uh, wheels of traits for autism, mm-hmm. yeah. my yeah. highest trait is hyperfixation. Mm-hmm. I love my special interests and I can, I, go into what my spouse and I call the vortex and I can go there for hours. So, but exactly what you're saying outside of interest, outside of special interest, my focus is really pretty poor, but Mm -hmm. I just don't spend much time there Mm -hmm. that it was harder for me to see the ADHD initially. And I notice it presents really differently in autistic people, especially I kind of think of like autistic dominant people with ADHD or ADHD dominant people. Yeah. And and some people it's really it's very mixed. There's not a dominant, but I often find it seems like there's a dominant neurotype with the yeah. other mixed in. Um so it's really complex. Yeah. I think one of the things that really drew me to your work that you because you focus on neurodivergencies, you talk a lot about like you know, your Venn diagrams do a lot of for showing like the overlap between the two. And and going through them, I think uh, the thing that 
that got me to to get in contact with you is because I saw one about like autism and ADHD and I was like, hmm, this is actually really, really, really helpful uh, because there are, there are some crossovers between the two and, you know, as we as we chatted before, we were talking about misdiagnosis and sort of the effects that that can have on someone's like uh, identity as well as mm-hmm. the functioning and treatment and medication. And I know it's it's a little bit off top topic, but it's um you know it's I think it's something that's really playing on my mind at the moment, and I wanted to mm-hmm. to talk a little bit about it. But I suppose going into sort of the main topic that we're here to talk about, PTSD, uh, post-traumatic um, stress and stress disorder, right? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. <laughs> it's making sure. Uh, I know we're going to touch. All those acronyms. Touch, yeah. <laughs> we're going to touch a little bit on complex PTSD, um, as mm-hmm. well as the overlap between autism and PTSD, what someone might want to do in terms of finding treatment, as well as what mental health providers should know about sort of the overlap between the two. Mm-hmm. So if there's the first question that I want to ask is, what is PTSD? Mm-hmm. Such a big question. I think, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to do the linear thing, but I'm also going to, before I do the linear, like this is the criteria, I kind of want to give us a conceptual map of what mm-hmm. it is. So first of all, I think sometimes people don't realize, and I think this is a really important part of the conversation, is that not everyone who experiences a trauma goes on to develop PTSD. In fact, most people don't. Mm -hmm. Um, It is the minority that experiences a trauma and moves on to to then develop PTSD. Sure. So um, this is a simplification, but a simplified conceptualization of what is happening with PTSD So the way that trauma gets encoded in the mind and the body, it is often not in a cohesive whole. It is like pieces, fragments. So particularly when a person doesn't have a cohesive narrative of the trauma, Mm -hmm. the, the body is encoding that in fragments. And so what can happen is the body, particularly the amygdala, which is like the fear Mm -hmm. center of the brain. I think of it as the safety alarm. I hate that one. What you hate that I hate metaphor? The amygdala. The oh, you amygdala. Hate the... <laughs> Understandably, the amygdala can be. Oh, I was going to swear, but it can be a little, <laughs> a little beast. We'll say beast. Yes. Yeah. yeah, the amygdala is not always fun to live with. So the amygdala, the fear center, doesn't know it's no longer in danger. It doesn't know it's no longer in the trauma. So with PTSD, the body is kind of re-remembering. It's it's still working to metabolize the trauma to create a cohesive whole. And so memories, associations, intrusive memories can flare up that memory of the trauma. And so the, this is why the person's like body is so hypervigilant because it's it's constantly on alert. So that that's, I mean, it's a simplification, but I feel like that's a helpful broad frame yeah. of what's happening to the body in PTSD. I really like the analogy of mm-hmm. the the fragmenting of the event because mm-hmm. you know, like, I mean, we, we we talked a little bit about before we started recording, but the the there's particular trauma that I've had recently, which it's it's really been been set off by the most random things at the most random times. Absolutely, yeah. and. It, it it is all always sort of in somehow connected to the event, but it's like mm-hmm. I, I'm responding to the whole event rather than that particular right part right. of it. Exactly, exactly. But your body doesn't know it's not responding to the whole thing, so it yeah. feels like you're responding to the whole thing. So something as simple as hearing a certain voice that sounds like a person that was associated with the trauma mm-hmm. can like the body's back in it. Yeah. And that's why life becomes so intolerable because because all of these little things, it's like bombarding the body with mm-hmm. taking it back to the trauma. Mm-hmm. And, and that's why life is is incredibly difficult with PTSD. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. W- would it, it would be helpful? Oh, 
<laughs> we're, we're doing okay. the autistic thing. Yeah, yeah. We're like, do I talk? Do you talk? It's your turn. Oh, have I not realized that your, <laughs> your sound cues of trying to speak or not? <laughs> um, would it be helpful for me to go through the DSM? Well, uh, ICD DSM criteria, like the linear, this is what, okay. That would be great. And yeah. I actually think this is a helpful reference point. I, I don't have it up yet, but I'm working. So I'm doing a series called the DSM-5 in pictures. And I actually have one for PTSD. I haven't put it up yet, but maybe we could add that to the show notes because I just think it, this is helpful in visuals. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, and the DSM-5, that's America, but like the ICD-10, which is used more globally, there's there's a lot of overlap. Like they're they're pretty much typically the same criteria. So, and for any of these conditions, there's like criteria A, B, C, D, and Typically, all of them have to be met for a diagnosis. So for PTSD, um, there's I'm going to walk through kind of the five core like buckets of criteria. So criteria A, there has to be some sort of traumatic event. For a long time, it was thought this had to be like a near-death experience or a fear of death. Um, they've added, you know, in the last like... 20, 30 years, not sure actually when it was added, but they've added sexual assault and victimization. Here's what's really interesting about criteria A, which we can talk more about when we talk about what I wish um, medical providers knew. Autistic people sometimes don't meet criteria A, but still have PTSD, meaning a less traumatic experience happens, but they Mm -hmm. still develop PTSD. So typically kind of the classic traumas are violence, hearing about a violent death of a loved one or some sort of assault are kind of the classic. But for autistic people, we can have less traumas and still, and I don't like the language of less traumas, but yeah, yeah. Like diagnostically. And it's it's hard to categorize. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's criteria A. Criteria B, intrusion symptoms. So these are things like flashbacks, nightmares. This is the the memory of the trauma coming back to the person. Again, those fragments um, coming back and creating a, a pretty intense response for the person. It could be intrusive memories or just just um, intense reactions to things that that remind the person of the trauma. And then avoidance. So an intrusion and avoidance. Those are really key pieces of PTSD. Um, avoidance is actively avoiding thoughts about the trauma or emotions related to it. This is harder to gauge because it's a really internal experience or external things. So for example, if someone has something traumatic happen in a grocery store, maybe then they avoid all grocery stores, but their their world is getting smaller and smaller as they're avoiding those those triggers that take their body back to the trauma. So that's a, a key part of it. Any questions so far as I've gone through? No, it's just uh, a few thoughts as well, because I completely get what you mean about the autistic people being a lot more sensitive to mm-hmm. sort of the development of it, because a lot of my my mental health difficulties have come from uh, negative experiences in, in teenagehood, in childhood, adolescence. And on paper, they're not particularly that bad. It's right. there, there was a lot of different different factors and different things involved, and there was a lot of anxiety and paranoia from from me mm-hmm. just because of the the school environment, you know, with the sensory stuff. Yeah, yeah. I know. Although, like, I feel sometimes quite silly if I'm sort of confessing to a you know a loved one what I'm struggling with, like the the memories and stuff, because. It's not on paper the worst thing that anyone's ever heard. It's like, sure, emotion, sure. emotion for example, emotional mm-hmm. bullying mm-hmm. over a long period mm-hmm. of time, just intermittent. Mm-hmm. And then, and then I hear about you know sort of individuals who you know have had a really rough time. I one of my friends, particularly that I won't name, they've gone through a lot of stuff, mm-hmm. a lot of different, mm-hmm. really intense traumatic events, and they've had some PTSD related to one particular part of that, but the other stuff, like they never had any issue with. And so 
I suppose it's it's quite confusing because I, I always have this picture of PTSD of mm-hmm. being this military related thing that happens when yeah. people go after war. Yeah, yeah. And something yeah. that perhaps is a bit more definite. It's like this is what caused my PTSD, or like right, right, yeah. Versus, and this um, we're kind of jumping ahead to complex trauma, but like <laughs> yeah. part of what you're describing is diffuse trauma. And by diffuse, you know, if I think about steam, like mm-hmm. when you're boiling something, like you can't point to something concrete. With with classic PTSD, there's typically like one concrete event you can point to. Sure. Diffuse trauma can, in some ways, be uh, more disorienting because there's not that concrete thing to point to. It's like, well, why am I having such an intense reaction? But it's like a lifetime of sensory trauma or a lifetime of emotional bullying is is incredibly traumatic. But it's so diffuse that it can be hard. Like, how do I process that? How do I point to that? We, I think we internalize a lot more weakness. So like, I must be weak that I'm not coping with this, especially yeah. if we're then comparing ourselves to like, oh my goodness, that person went through something really traumatic and they're That's okay. That's a really good point, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. But there's, I think, a lot of reasons, which we'll get into later, I think about why we're more vulnerable to develop PTSD, both because of our experiences, but also just our neurology makes us more vulnerable. Sure, sure. Well, um, you, you mentioned a little bit about complex PTSD. Um, is that something mm-hmm. that you could maybe break mm-hmm. down a little bit for us? Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, be, before I jump to that, can I finish the PTSD criteria? Yeah, Otherwise yeah, my autistic it, yeah. brain will be like Jumping skipping, again. like, wait, you never finished the linear thing. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> so, so D and E are the last two criteria I'll cover. And I actually think D is really important. It's alterations to cognition. Um, that could just mean that the me- you don't have the full memory of the trauma, which is common, you know, um, kind of that amnesia around the event. But it can also mean like exaggerated negative beliefs about yourself or the world. This I often feel like is one of the, the more traumatic parts of PTSD is a person's worldview gets shattered. It's like their view of themselves or their view of the world becomes incredibly shattered. You know, I, I also work a lot in the intersection of spirituality and therapy. And so I see this a lot where a person's spiritual frame breaks down as part of post-trauma. And so they're dealing with the trauma, but then they're dealing with the trauma of their whole way of orienting to the world is broken. And again, sort if you think like about a, an autistic person, oh, go ahead. Sort of like a fourth wall break, like when their glass yeah. shatters and yeah the the veil is lifted yeah yeah and then think about how disorienting that is for an autistic person right because all of a sudden all the things i thought were certain either about myself Mm -hmm. or the world are now broken like that's a that's so traumatizing of and now i don't even know what i believe about xyz you kind of have to build build yourself up from Mm -hmm. ground zero i suppose right yeah yeah so so d was that cognition thing um and a lot of times it's really negative views about self. So like I deserved this or I brought this on myself. Um, I think this happens a lot for autistic people. And then E is alterations in arousal or reactivity. So that's that hyperactivity. Autistic and ADHD people already have more reactive nervous systems. So this is going to be even more exaggerated with PTSD. So like a bigger startle response. This ties back to the amygdala. The amygdala is just firing of like you have to be on guard for signals of threat. And so the body is just like so much energy, so much cortisol, which is our stress hormone, just pulsing through our bodies. So that heightened reactivity, which also makes sleep hard. And then sleep is already like baseline hard for autistic people. So if you're throwing PTSD on top of it, like I I share with you. very important for like Uh breaking sleep cycles and stuff, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Massive. And being able to get out of our stress response is really important for sleep. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that sounds I, crazy because like the autism, the sensitivity and sort of like, you know, needing that, that concreteness as well as, you know, perhaps being ADHD and having the already hyperactive nervous system, mm-hmm, adding something mm-hmm. like that on top, which. It's terrible. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I, so I shared with you before we started recording in my early twenties, I had PTSD Mm -hmm. and I, for a year didn't, oh, I can't say I didn't sleep. Of course I slept, but like I would be up until 5am not sleeping. And then I would get, I was in grad school at the time and I'd get like maybe two or three hours. Like my sleep was so dysregulated. And I think it was like autistic sleep. I've, I've always had sleep issues. But then when the PTSD was on top of that, like my body was just like my systems were not <laughs> operating well, especially sleep. Like it just didn't happen mm-hmm. very often. Well, um, one question I want to ask, because I, I know that there's, you know, with PTSD, there's an action of, you know, trauma being sort of included. but if some if someone's struggling for pa- perhaps with like memory blocks and stuff and they, mm-hmm. they they don't really sort of process it or remember this this event i know this has happened with uh, my friends how are you supposed like is there any sort of distinguishing factors that you can draw upon to know if it's just you feeling stressed and anxious or whether it's just mm. or whether it's related to some kind of ptsd Yeah. I mean, that's a good question because stress and anxiety can also impact memory and then ADHD can also impact memory. So, I mean, I think you'd, you'd want to look outside of memory. You'd want to look at some of these other criteria points I've mentioned, like, are those also present? And that's how you would tease out, is this ADHD memory fog? Is this stress memory fog? Or is this traumatic? You know, is there the hyperactive? like hyperactivation? Is there the flashbacks that those intrusive symptoms? Is there avoidance happening? So you would look to see if other pieces of the puzzle were present. Sure. Could you, um, I know, I know it's, could you clarify a bit more on that aspect of my brain is so still so slow from yes, from the, from recently. Yeah. That I'm totally. I'm, I'm just wondering about God. I don't know what's happening to me. Flashbacks, because oh, you yeah. know when we think of flashbacks, we think of like the movie example. You know, you uh-huh. flash back to an event, you play through like to ten to thirty seconds of, mm-hmm. of the clip of the event. But what 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 does a flashback actually sort of present as, or what does it? feel Mm -hmm. like because sometimes it can be quite hard for people to visualize Mm -hmm. exactly what that means yeah yeah that's a good question especially if someone has aphantasia like the inability to see images which that's higher among neurodivergent people so it's and it is kind of a vague description it's the like re-experiencing of the trauma so i don't know if you've ever had a night tear i as a child i had night tears where you wake up and you think it's different than a nightmare because it feels like it's happening. I feel like that's kind of a helpful reference point of you feel like you're back in the experience and, and your, your body's reacting and, and you're, you're disoriented because it's, and, and there, it might, it might just be a moment, but that's where strategies like grounding is really helpful for PTSD. Grounding strategies are strategies that help you re-anchor in this moment because it, it kind of helps you pull back to like, no, this is what's happening. This is what's real. So a flashback would be something that it's pulling you back and it, it's physically and cognitively disorienting because it, it's feeling like you're back in the experience. You it might not like have... Flipping back and forth between what's mm-hmm. happening now and what's happening mm-hmm. in the past. Like, and it's often triggered by something. So it could be triggered by a sound, like a sound. So like you talked about military PTSD, you know, like a loud sound might activate a flashback or there are just certain signals could activate it. Certain ways of being touched on the body could activate a flashback, but it, it might, again, it might be very fragmented. It might not be this cohesive picture of like, Oh, I'm, I'm seeing it. It might just, it might be the body responding in that visceral way of being back in the trauma. Yeah. That's really interesting. Was it, was there any of a sort of criteria of that? Um, of PTSD or should we move I, on to complex? Yeah, we can, yeah, we can move on. Um, there's a few other, like, there's always a few um, disclaimers, like not attributed to this or that, but these are the core. Yeah. These are the core criteria. So complex PTSD, 
there's a lot of fantastic trauma advocates who have been saying, we've got to get this into the DSM or into the diagnostic criteria. I don't know if maybe it's different in England. In the US, it's not recognized as an official diagnosis, which is Mm -hmm. really, really unfortunate because it is different in nature than PTSD. So with complex trauma, it is more of that diffuse trauma that there's not that one concrete trauma to point to. It's often associated with like complex trauma in childhood. So um, often when there's abuse in the home or other situations can cause it as well. But it's living in an environment that is perpetually unsafe. In this situation, the amygdala becomes very protective Mm -hmm. by becoming very, very heightened. I think a common metaphor, so if if we think about the amygdala as kind of, you know, the fire alarm, a healthy amygdala, a healthy fire alarm will, will go off when there's fire in the home. Yeah. When you've grown up in an environment that is perpetually unsafe, it actually becomes really protective to have a really sensitive alarm. But what happens, it's like, well, cooking pancakes or putting something in the microwave will make the fire alarm go off. Like Mm. it, it, the fire alarm thinks it's in danger when it's not because thinking about a child, if they're in a chronically stressful, unsafe environment, it is really protective to know, well, when is my parent maybe going to flip? And become dangerous. Mm. I need to be able to have like a really fine detection of that. So it starts as a protective mechanism, but then it creates so much suffering. It can become paranoia, but it's it's more in that bodily kind of hyper aware of your environment, hyper vigilant. So again, in that stress state chronically, which is just really hard on a person's body and mental health. That's really interesting. I mean, I, uh, I think, I think, you know, for, throughout my life, I mean, I, I've been experiencing quite severe mental health since I was fourteen, so about eleven years now. You know, quite quite often, I, my memory is very good, and I can remember things mm-hmm. very very well. But I do sometimes, particularly around school or around. Uh, you know, talking, talking about school, I do, I have like gaps in my memory. It's like, um, I try Mm -hmm. to talk about something and then my brain shuts off and then I can't Mm. retrieve what I was going to say again. Hmm. And it's something that, you know, I've, I've talked about or tried to talk about in the past with like therapists and stuff, but it's, it's, it's very difficult Mm -hmm. to actually form a cohesive sentence that Mm-hmm. describes it because every it's like mm-hmm. i have a it's like my brain brain retaliates to me trying to to actively put mm-hmm. myself in a situation because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. i i really identify with the uh, the idea of sort of diffuse diffuse ptsd because there, there definitely has been a lot of mental health difficulties in my life and a lot of things that i guess aren't very explainable like mm-hmm. random mm-hmm spurts of anxiety for seemingly seemingly very very small things hmm. and I, re- I really like that that sort of concept of the of the diffuse because it's it's just you know for me for me if i was to try and identify exactly what was my issue i i couldn't really do that it's mm-hmm. it's a mix of mm-hmm. the environment and people mm-hmm. and things that are happening and, and how I was feeling at the time. Hmm. And it's all, it's all very much a blur. And, you know, I, t- I have to make a, a little bit of a confession when you, when you were talking about like the sort of the diagnostic criteria and the flash flashbacks and mm-hmm. stuff, I was getting a little bit of those, those flashbacks. Mm. Sure. Sure. And it kind of, it, it's kind of, it's very, very strange because it's, it's almost like, I, I related it to to more of like a, an a, when I was trying to explain it to other people, um, to more of like an absence seizure where I just kind of mm. my brain hmm. sort of blacks out. But yeah, I do have like 
different images prop up in my mind and it kind of Uh strays me away from reality and then yeah I come back and I I definitely definitely identify with the sort of the fourth wall break the reality crashing Mm -hmm. down because no for throughout most of my life I've been having quite a few like existential crises Mm -hmm. I don't know what the plural Mm -hmm. term for it is but Hmm. So I, 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 I'm really, I'm really not sure. I mean, autism is something that I'm very comfortable with, and I, I'm very aware of, and I know a lot about. But it's the other things that, mm-hmm. and sort of the crossover between them that's really hard, especially when in yeah. therapy for neurotypical individuals. Yeah, yeah, and, and there's so much crossover. I think it's seventy percent of us have, you know, a co-occurring wow. yeah. mental health condition. Mm-hmm. I'm actually surprised it's that low. Many of us have more than one. Yeah. And so it, it is such a, it's such a more complex story than autism. It's well, yeah. autism and what, like, what is it intersecting with? Autism and what? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm having an association. I, so one thing I often say is, you know, autistic people, I, I notice a lot of us are very existential. I hadn't yet I hadn't connected that to trauma before, but I wonder how many of us are existential because it's trauma driven, mm-hmm. like be- because we need to be existential to survive and we mm-hmm. need to like create a worldview that works for us, a self concept that works for us. Mm-hmm. Like, what if that is one way that we survive this world is by becoming deeply existential? Mm-hmm. I think it's, it, I mean, it's, it's something that's propped up like many, many, many times in my life, these existential crises, it's like the, mm-hmm. the typical, Same. um, what do you know, the philosopher who decided that life, everything wasn't real and he decided to just live in a bin or something on the side of the street. Mm-hmm. I can't remember what his name was. <laughs> I identified with that a lot and I, I've been in situations where I just kind of, you know, you know, what are, are my thoughts real? I mean, how do I know that that what I'm thinking is yeah. concrete? So then, how uh-huh. can I actually uh-huh. have anything in certainty? And mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. there there is a real desire for s- certainty and mm-hmm. sort of stability in very complex things that don't inherently have that, like mm-hmm. existence and like understanding and perceiving the world. Um, there's so so many ad- avenues which are just completely subjective, which are just like, mm-hmm. you know, ma- massive parts of how we sort of process things. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I find it yeah. very 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 interesting. I've seen, I think I saw a, a paper on it before about existentialism, but I might want to to brush up a bit more about it. Mm-hmm. It's always been yeah, I, 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 it's a fascinating combo I, I recently had the thought that i wonder so i didn't realize i was autistic till my daughter was diagnosed so mm-hmm. i was 37 when i was diagnosed that i've sometimes wondered if like i knew i just couldn't figure out myself like i was just going to be a mystery to me so i spent all my energy trying to figure out kind of existence i so i before i became a psychologist i actually did my master's of divinity at Princeton and I studied theology and I was like deep into theology philosophy. I was spending so much energy trying to figure out the meaning of life, trying to figure out like what is the one best way to live. And I I think it was, it was a reaction to, well, I can't figure myself out, but maybe I can figure out this whole existence Mm -hmm. religion thing. Work from the outside in. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. And I and my existential anxiety has gone down since discovering my autism because it's like oh I can understand myself now, so it's yeah, okay definitely. if I can't understand the universe. It's, it's mm. a weird, it's a weird thing. But yeah, there's a lot of things when I was younger because I, I I was diagnosed when I was ten, uh, mm-hmm. ten years old. So it was quite. I mean, it's not early, but it's it's not a late diagnosis per se. Mm-hmm. And I I used to have very very strange ways of. You used to have very, very strange ways of sort of conceptualizing things about myself. Mm-hmm. So like, for example, I, I thought that I had different personalities because yeah, I had, yeah. I had different uh-huh. emotions. So like, yep. 
when I was in a certain emotional state, I, I didn't identify like the person that I was before in that emotional state mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. because of the alexithymia, not being able yeah. to feel it. Mm -hmm. I just saw that my personality was changing on a day-to-day -day basis. So I was like, like that. And it, there was little things like that that, that have occurred mm -hmm. during my life that, you know, learning a bit more and especially about alexithymia, it was, it was absolutely mm -hmm. life-changing for me kind of understanding hey actually this perception of my reality it has there's a reason mm -hmm. why i'm seeing it like this where other people are just kind of taking it you know for, for granted and mm -hmm. it's just a part of things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And i think that sort of different experience and not being able to fully grasp exactly what's going on because or you know autism's not really in the picture not really you know thinking mm -hmm. about autism as you're not aware of every single aspect of it. So I find that that really interest that really interesting, especially when I was young. I used to think I was an alien, genuinely. Uh, and, I, I have heard that one so much. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting the kind of myths and stories we come up with, and until we realize it's autism. Mm. I would love to see like a collection of all of the different stories autistic mm. people told themselves until they. Until they yeah. got the right language to understand themselves. Like well, I'm, I'm really, really enjoying talking about this because obviously I, I, I am so into philosophy, uh, ethics. I, I love like mm -hmm. the, the, I, I listen in, in my spare time. I tend to watch a lot of YouTube stuff around different mm -hmm. philosophies and different sort of concepts mm -hmm. and ways of looking at the world. Uh, but I know that we're talking specifically about PTSD mm -hmm. today. So I guess now that we have sort of a broad and sort of a rough understanding of, of PTSD, a little bit about CPTSD, could you tell us a little bit about like the overlap between autism and PTSD and whether mm -hmm. it's different for an autistic person or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's interesting. Older studies used to think that autistic people experience PTSD at like a similar rate to non-autistic mm -hmm. people. Sure. But th thankfully, there's some emergent research, some newer research that is looking at it. Now, it's hard. If, if you've seen my infographics, you'll notice that the prevalence rates are like huge gaps. So like I have an infographic on trauma and autism, and it's 32 to 60% of autistic people yeah. report PTSD. Yeah. That's a huge gap. And it's because it's from two different studies. Mm -hmm. And every study is going to have a different sample. So it's, of course, it's hard to get a really accurate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm capturing of it. But what we are seeing is that autistic people are more prone to develop PTSD. So we experience it at much higher rates. For reference, about 4%, maybe 4.5% of the general population experiences PTSD. So even if it's that more conservative number of 30, that mm. is still like a huge increased risk of PTSD. It's like low population, but a large amount of the Perhaps mm -hmm. the PTSD diagnoses are still going to that one. Well, it's not one percent, but the minority of autistic people, mm -hmm. or just are. If you took any one individual autistic person, their risk of developing PTSD would be. Um, I, I mean, this is an estimate, but like tenfold the risk, or or, yes, or yeah. potentially higher. Yeah. There's different theories, and I have some of my own theories. You mentioned earlier having a really good memory. I do too. A lot of autistic people have really good autobiographical memory. So if you think about a traumatic event, we might encode it with more intensity, especially if we have mm. hypersensitivities. The sensory experience of the trauma is, is going to be encoded with more intensity. So that's one of the theories as to why we might be more prone to PTSD. Another one is we have so I've, I've done, I have a series on this, the neurodivergent nervous system, but we just, we have more reactive nervous systems. What that means is, so we have, everyone has like a window of tolerance and that's how much can I take in? How much stressors can I take in both from internal and from my environment and stay within a regulated window of still tolerance? Still function, do, do mm -hmm. everyday activities. Still function, exactly. Autistic people tend to have a more narrow window, so, so do ADHD, window of tolerance, meaning we more easily flip into a stress state 
So that's either hypermobility, so fight or flight, stress response, or hypomobility, like that freeze state. So we're more likely to flip into one of those two stress states more easily. So it takes less for us to get into our stress response. And I think that is probably a pretty significant contributor to why we're more prone to develop PTSD after a trauma is our nervous systems are going to have a harder time regulating and recovering afterward. Yeah. And we have higher rates of victimization. So those are kind of the the factors and there's more, but those are the big ones. That's, that's interesting about like the more likely to freeze, more likely to Mm -hmm. hypermobility, hypermobility, as you, as you said, mobility, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Or I might be confusing words there because it mobilizes us for action, hyper reactivity or hypo reactivity. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was thinking joints like, (laughs) like, yeah, (laughs) I I think I was, because it, mobilizes us for action or we kind of freeze. Mm -hmm. I was combining concepts there, which my ADHD brain does all the time. No, no, I do that as well. It's how you think of new things. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And create new words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of the hyper reactivity or under reactivity, would you say that that, because autistic people, you know, we tend to get into one of two states when we get stressed we either mm-hmm. shut down or mm-hmm. we melt down and what yes, one is same idea very yep. introverted sort of internal mm-hmm. shutting down mm-hmm. and functioning freezing mm-hmm. the other very very erratic all over the place lots of mm-hmm. emotions lots of physical movements and would you would you say that those those are kind of like the a good ways of of thinking about that sort of hyperactivity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thingy. Yeah. It's it's the same concept exactly of it, either shutting down or going into stress states. And there there's some research that suggests autistic people may be more not necessarily more likely to do one or the other but more likely than non-autistic people to go into the shutdown mode. Mm-hmm. So there's a study of autistic children who had their blood drawn and they measured cortisol throughout the day before the blood draw, during the blood draw, after they did d- different measures of cortisol. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they found, no surprise, autistic children had more cortisol, higher peaks. They um, excreted cortisol for longer, and it took mm-hmm. them longer to get back to their baseline. But what they yeah. also found is that some of those children who were having big cortisol spikes, they weren't showing hyperreactive behavior. They looked calm meaning they were entering more of that shutdown stress state. Mm. So this is what um, I get this language from Finn Graden, who's a fantastic autistic advocate, faux regulation, that this is faux regulation. You look regulated to the outside world, but actually Mm. your body's in a very stressed state, but it's that shutdown. So So you look calm, you look very regulated, but you're not, your body's in a stress state. And that, that seems to be more common for autistic people. I love to, I love to that word. Do that. I love that word. Isn't that a great word? Yeah, because yeah, it's yeah. it's it is true. I I kind of feel in like a constant state of like I've got restless legs all the time. Mm-hmm. Not like the restless mm-hmm. leg syndrome, but it's like a mild like that. I always feel sort of I always felt like my like there's ants crawling on my bones or there's like or, or something related to energy or s- something like that. Mm-hmm. I feel like that most of the time. And it, I, I like that way because I, I think, you know, hiding, especially when you've, when you've had like anxiety for a long time, it's like hiding that anxiety so well, even though, you know, I could be like on the scale of one to a hundred, I could be like a, mm-hmm. 60, mm-hmm. 70 most of the day. But as soon as I mm-hmm. flip into that 80 and above, then, then that's when it becomes like the fight or yep. flight, the shut down or yep. down. Yep. And for the rest of the day, I kind of just, even, even sometimes I appear to myself that I'm regulated. I'm just normal because that's what I'm mm-hmm. used to. Mm-hmm. Cortisol. <laughs> I've done a lot of also research. Also, a beast. Cortis- cortisol and the amygdala. If we could just 
Put it aside. I, I, yeah. I hate that yeah. stuff. Yeah. I always, I always, that's how I explain it to people. I say, well, I'm okay. My cortisol is just very high. <laughs> oh, I love that. I'm okay. My, I love that. That's a great way. <laughs> Cause it's a way of saying I'm not okay, but I'm okay. Like I'm, I'm okay. Not being okay. Like I'm yeah. a, like my body's having this experience and I can tolerate it. Yeah. I, f- I find oh, I it very that. useful to, to use like names for things that cause mm-hmm. things because mm-hmm. if you say that I feel anxious, um, some people, mm-hmm. they, they don't really take that on board. They're saying that, Oh, you feel anxious. It's like, okay. Uh-huh. Uh, but yeah. if you say my cortisol is raised a lot and, you know, cortisol mm-hmm. is like the thing that, that sort of f- makes you, mm-hmm. sort of your brain activates the body, make, yep, activates absolutely. Your body makes you go up and you get too much of it and you get over, overstimulated and you're hyper aware of everything. People find it a lot easier to, to grasp that there's this molecule mm-hmm. in my body causing yeah. me to act yeah. or feel like this yeah. rather than me just saying, I feel like this. <laughs> Well, and people, it's less character based. People so often hear things like I'm anxious is like a character statement or like, oh, just calm down. Or like, I mean, then you get all (laughs) kinds of unhelpful comments, right? (laughs) But something like physiological, like grounding it and like, oh, my cortisol's high. It's like, Mm. okay. Yeah. I'm going to steal that one. That's that's (laughs) really good. There's uh, there's the other stuff you can talk about. uh, Oh, that opening's not, not here for me. I can't do that thing. Mm -hmm. Don't feel like Mm -hmm. that off all the, Mm -hmm. the serotonin. You know, I'm up and down so much. I need a bit more of that. What if that's how autistic people just, you know, all those like small talk, like, how are you today? <laughs> what if we just responded with like neurochemicals? Like, you know, my serotonin feels a little bit I low do. today. I do. <laughs> this is what I do. I, I'm very, I love it. Very, it's, well, it, it's it's good to kind of grab, I've grown these concepts in physicality because, you know, people do. Mm-hmm you know, take it as a character trait or a personality trait. Mm-hmm. Are you yeah. feeling depressed? Oh yeah, I felt depressed. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, my brain is completely depleted of serotonin, mm-hmm. which does this, this, and this. And like, they're like, oh my God, that must be awful. It's like, it was mm-hmm. the same as saying that I'm feeling depressed, but. But you don't get advice, I bet. Like if you say I'm depressed, I'm anxious, typically you get advice. Whereas mm-hmm. if you ground it in neurochemistry. Yeah. Well, my, yeah. my, mine is, it's, it's most, you know, you have that, there's a, a infographic that I came on, came across sort of like a YouTube video, where it's talking like the, the causes of depression as like situational, mm-hmm. uh, neuro, neurochemical, mm-hmm. psychological, existential. And mm. I think my, my mental health, cause it's been, it's been like this for such a long time and it seems to be. Although it's worsened by events happening, it seems mm-hmm. to just drop and rise as, as it will um, sometimes. Yeah. So yeah. I find it very, very useful to like think about it in ne- neurochemicals and like things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that's going back to like the PTSD overlap. I'm, I'm sure that's a factor too, if we have more um, vulnerable like neurology, more vulnerable neurochemicals. So if we're predisposed to depression and then we mm-hmm. experience something traumatic, like yeah, we're gonna be way more vulnerable to developing PTSD afterwards. Mm-hmm. Well, um I guess we we've talked a lot about like the issues around it and sort of maybe the ways <laughs> the strange ways that that Thomas describes his emotions um and speaks about himself in the third person. And I guess what I want to know is, you know, we know we know about PTSD. It's very complex. Obviously, you need a professional to mm-hmm. help you understand mm-hmm. if it if it is the case. But if you feel like you sort of identify with what what we're talking about, the person listening, I did find with what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, what can they do? What mm-hmm. what what should they do? Um, if they feel like they might be struggling with PTSD or, or mm-hmm. CPTSD. Yeah. I mean, there, there's absolutely treatment for PTSD. And um, before we started recording, we talked about innate neurodivergence versus acquired neurodivergence. Yeah, yeah. So aut- autism is an innate, like it's you're born with that neurology. PTSD is acquired. 
And so it's an acquired neurodivergence that can be treated, can be supported, we can heal from it. I think for a lot of people, the combination of pharmaceutical, so medication support and therapy tends to be the ideal equation. Mm. This gets much more complicated for autistic people. For we, a we don't have of it reasons. sussed out anyway, just for for helping autistic people with like mild anxiety and uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Partly, like therapists are scared of us. If you go to a therapist and you're like, "I'm autistic and I have PTSD," a lot of therapists, if they don't have like extensive training in autism, mm-hmm. they're like, "Oh, I don't do autism." Like it, it feels. I mean, talk about alien. Like a lot of therapists treat it like this alien other of like oh, you have to go to a specialist for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So finding support. So finding someone who's not scared of you and will take you on, but then also finding someone who understands your neurology. So for example, alexithymia, Mm -hmm. someone who's autistic could be in therapy and and suffering a great deal, but their, their mood is flat. They're maybe talking about incredibly traumatic things, but not showing a lot of emotion. So a, a therapist might misinterpret that as they're not suffering yes. be, because they're not displaying their emotion in the typical way. I suppose you have so, the, the, the lack mm-hmm. of using the indirect communication as well in that. That as well. And yes, exactly. And also then with trauma work, really considering the sensory profile, a lot of trauma work, not all trauma work, but a lot of trauma work involves exposure to some extent because one of the core symptoms of PTSD is avoidance and avoidance actually perpetuates the anxiety around the trauma and it makes it grow. So, so trauma treatments, different levels of exposure. Some it's like really intense exposure, like a lot of kind of military PTSD treatments are Mm -hmm. very intense exposure. It's not all that intense, but there's some element of exposure to talking about it. So considering the sensory profile of the person when you're doing exposure-based work. Mm -hmm. I think that is one of the tricky things. You asked me what people could do, and I'm telling you like all the hard (laughs) things about getting. So let me flip to something more hopeful. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So those are, I mean, those are just some of the barriers people experience. Um, There is no one like therapy that works for all autistic people because we're an incredibly diverse group. Some of the therapies that I, I often hear autistic people have positive experiences with include internal family systems or parts work. And and that can also be really powerful for trauma. So IFS is the acronym, internal family systems. Mm -hmm. EMDR is effective. I think, yeah, it's, I, I do some IFS and I I really like it. It's, you're talking about different parts of yourself, which makes it, it, it takes this kind of abstract idea of the fact that we have multiple parts of us and turns it concrete, which I like. So I like it for autistic people for a lot of reasons, and I like it for trauma. And so I think it can go really well in the combination of autistic trauma. Some people respond really well to EMDR. Other people don't. Cognitive processing therapy is kind of the gold standard for PTSD in a lot of circles. I think that's where you really want to be considering the person's sensory profile. I think some autistic people can certainly respond well to it. Some have a really strong reaction to it, but I think, I think, so yeah, there's all these different theories. I think finding a therapist that you feel really safe with connected to is probably the most important part Mm -hmm. is, is this someone who is curious about your experience who you feel connected to because that co-regulation that happens in therapy as you're working through your trauma, like I don't want to be dismissive of what kind of therapy you do, but I actually think that's probably the most important is finding a person that you can connect with and feel safe with. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you don't feel like you have to, to mask how you are. You don't feel Mm-hmm. That, you can tell just... like, Hey, I'm getting sensory overloaded or like I'm shutting down. I know I look regulated, but I'm shutting down. We need to like hit the brakes here. Someone mm-hmm. where you can safely communicate that. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm not going to kind of look at you with an inquisitive, like, mm-hmm. what do you mean? Like, 
What do you mean? You'll you look so fine. calm. You're fine. Yeah. Just do, uh, I've, yeah. had, I've had lots of lots of ones like that before, but yeah, I, I I'm just my head's going off on like all the berries and therapy and stuff, and yeah, it's the I think finding someone that you can genuine genuinely connect with it's is the best because like if you if you're always closed off and you're trying to like present in a certain way then it's going to be really hard to Mm -hmm. to -hmm. open up about things and i've actually like throughout all the years of therapy that i did when i was younger and you know some of the therapy that i've done in adulthood really it's 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 really tough it's it's hard to find anyone (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this the the we already have an issue with employment and pretty much all of Mm. the autism specialists that i can find in in the uk like there's no like general healthcare version of it like Mm -hmm, it's just mm -hmm. you go there for them to help you treat with your depression anxiety but not in the context of autism. If I was to say, Alexa, if I'm to them, they would have no idea exactly in, mm-hmm. at all what I mean. They, mm-hmm. They, mm-hmm. Even just the basic concepts. So the majority of the actual therapy that's done is me explaining to them bits about autism. So it's like almost uh, I'm educating yeah. them rather than yeah. telling, you know, yeah, absolutely. telling my experiences and having it sort of dissected and broken up. Uh-huh. And, Sort yeah. Of processed and yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so much education that happens. There, there's a really interesting article. It, it's a qualitative study. It, it talked about autistic people's experiences with therapy, and I think that was one of the themes that came up. I just feel like they were educating their therapists about what <laughs> autism is. Which, I, I mean, on one hand, if it's a long-term therapist and like they're curious, I think, you know, I, I think that makes sense that we do some of that and and that can be part of explaining our internal world. But if it's like a shorter term therapy and you're in a person's feeling like they're spending the bulk of the hour educating versus like actually diving into the work. Yeah. I mean, that's just not a great equation. It's also, uh, it's also awareness of the, the overlap of things as well. Like, uh, so the, the different in, the different reactions that we can have to different mm-hmm. conditions, different mm-hmm. neurodivergencies, mm-hmm. Um, acquired neurodivergencies. Right, right. Like, like PTSD. Mm-hmm. I mean, no, but panic, panic disorder for me, I'd probably say that acquired. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's, it's a hard world to navigate. Yeah. Yeah. Can I skip? I'm starting to feel guilty that I was so negative. Can I skip back to some practical suggestions for people who are maybe oh, listening yeah. to this and like no, just like it. feeling so deflated now? Yeah, yeah. I think so. I know for for me, just learning the science of what was happening to my body with PTSD mm-hmm. was so regulating. Similar to like like oh, my dopamine's low, yeah. and I think for autistic people, if we can understand what's happening to our bodies, it's really helpful. A, a good therapist can do this, but you can also actually do this with like YouTube of like the anatomy of PTSD or just understanding the fight or flight response and then being able to kind of be like, okay, my amygdala is going haywire right now. So I think for autistic people learning what's happening is really helpful and you, and people can do that on their own. The second thing is grounding strategies. People hear a lot about relaxation strategies, which helps get us, get us out of our stress response. Sure. Um, I think the two like basic ingredients of a good trauma treatment starts with grounding and then relaxation strategies. But I actually prioritize grounding first. And that is, again, those practices that help us relocate ourselves in the here and the now. So it can be as simple as going and washing your hands with cold water and focusing your attention like this is what the water feels like on my hands or creating pressure or like there's the classic five, four, three, two, one, like list five things you see yeah. going through the senses. I actually have some grounding strategies up on my website available for free, like a PDF, or you can YouTube or Google grounding strategies, but education of what 
the heck is happening to your body, grounding strategies, and then getting some like medication support. I think for a lot of people, That's especially if they can't sleep, those would be kind of until it's, you find a, a unicorn therapist that knows how to work with you. <laughs> well, in terms of the medication front, I mean, I don't know much about PTSD medications. I imagine it would be similar to anxiety, would it? Or is it kind of more towards like the type of kind treatment? Of head, yeah, I mean, it depends. Like... It depends on the person. Dep- depends on the provider. Depends on what they're like presenting with if they're if they're more dominantly like shut down depressed versus if they're more in that activated state um, but getting like good pharmaceutical support just to help your body kind of be able to absorb some mm. of it especially because like i mentioned i think our sleep gets really dysregulated for autistic people sure sure but yeah there's there's a variety of different medication options well it's just out of interest because i know that you know, mental health, but I mean, t- you know, obviously autism is, you know, we have all these, these co-occurring things and um, one of the particular, you know, th- things that has propped up a lot for uh, myself and a lot of people that I've talked to is um, substance use. Like, mm-hmm. is there, is there any particular, I know, I know in general, the advice is to avoid substances mm-hmm. like uh, alcohol mm-hmm. you know marijuana i think the illegal mm-hmm. drugs mm-hmm. is there any are there any particular sort of drugs that you know about in that sense that are really really bad for people who have ptsd mm. is there like mm-hmm. a specific so i mean i don't know about like really specifically bad because of the autism, but like alcohol is a common, it commonly co-occurs with PTSD. It commonly co-occurs with high masculine autistic people. And it's a way of kind of it. Alcohol gives the nervous system, like it feels like a moment of relief from some of that hyperactivity. So, mm -hmm, so it makes sense why people go to alcohol with PTSD, especially if they don't have like, pharmaceutical support they're kind of they're self-medicating the risks with when you have a substance use disorder and something like ptsd and if the person's adhd also impulsivity goes way up so if someone's experiencing suicidality you know thoughts about wanting to die or wanting to kill Mm -hmm. themselves which can be common with ptsd and you've got substance on top of that (laughs) and autism i would say that's a very dangerous triad and that again, that's another reason why I'm a big fan of getting pharmaceutical support so mm-hmm. that it makes people less vulnerable to self medicate through substances that would increase other vulnerabilities. So I think it makes a lot of sense that a lot of us go to substances. I think it's, it's, it's an, another, like, to me, that's another one of the really sad pieces about my field not understanding autism better is that they're not understanding a lot of the people that they're treating with substance use and PTSD are, are actually like undiagnosed autistic and ADHD people who. They're kind of self-medicating because yeah. the, the, the yeah. medications they produce for a neurotypical brain mm-hmm. and they're not particularly like for, yeah. for me, like, you know, doctors always say, Oh, SSRI is great for depression and anxiety. Hmm. Great for depression. Mm-hmm. Anxiety makes it a lot worse for me. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. There's, there's well, and that's, those... Sorry. Yes, it's tricky. It's tricky because some of those medications activates the central nervous system. So if someone's prone to anxiety, some some medications will actually make their anxiety worse. Mm. So yeah, which is why working with someone and it, we also are more sensitive to medication. Mm. So a lot of t- times it's recommended autistic people start at a lower dose. I'm not a prescriber just for like consent, but it's recommended people start at a lower dose mm-hmm. often. And sometimes it takes more medication trials to find the medication that works for us because our bodies are more sensitive. 11 years and counting, we're still going with it. Uh, mm-hmm. Trying, going through the pharmaceutical list. 
There's not as much. Yep. I don't think there's as much uh, leniency with the types of medications used in the UK. I know there's a okay. lot of medications which uh, I hear about talk, talked about more, like from like mm. American individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas in the UK, it seems to be like SSRIs or the tricyclics or like the uh, typical mm-hmm. the benzos the the health health related drugs mm-hmm. but there's not there's not a lot of like explorative or or sort of specialized yeah. medications being like tried and tested and it's uh, mm-hmm. i mean what you're saying about the the sensitivity to medication i i really really identify with that totally and it's, and it's all it's also very strange because i i'm always an under responder to like certain certain types of drugs particularly painkillers so Mm -hmm. like you know if i was to go to the dentist to get my teeth done they would need to put like um twice twice the normal dose in order for me to numb myself properly yeah but then with medication that like has an impact on my brain it's like oh um, gosh yeah very sensitive to it and Uh i talked to uh, Dr. Temple Grandin. I don't know if you, mm-hmm. you know of her. I saw, the, yeah, I saw that podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, she was she was talking about antidepressants. She 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 was advocating for a very very sort of low dose and stuff. And mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. definitely have tried that. Mm-hmm. Tried those low doses. They haven't been. They haven't had enough of an effect for me. And um, mm-hmm. at the moment, just as a. No, I like to be open about medication because there's no reason to feel bad about what you absolutely just not. Just, yeah. just as what you would say about your physical, you know, ailments and their medications. Uh, at the moment, I'm on about forty milligrams of citalopram, which is mm-hmm. relatively high dose. And for and I also have to take it with metazapine, which is mm-hmm. like a really weird class of drugs. It's like an NAS as I don't know. And that it's very, very sedative and it's a very long acting mm-hmm. sedative, so it takes a while to get out of your system and stuff. Mm-hmm. That's really, really helped with the anxiety aspect of mm-hmm. the SSRIs. Mm-hmm. So it's always like a it's it's a weird combination. It's like I go too high on the metazapine, my depression gets worse because I'm so sluggish mm-hmm. all the time and sedated. Mm-hmm. And then the opposite mm-hmm. side, if I this telepram gets too high, I'm too wired and I'm too anxious. And mm-hmm. you know, all of these benefits that I'm getting from the depression are just completely mm-hmm. absolved from all the anxiety mm-hmm. that I'm experiencing. It's like a teeter totter of like the more you address this, then you've got to, yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Are these nervous systems of ours are such delicate things, like too much activation, too much mm. shutdown. Yeah, it's. It's like the whole These thing delicate with, bodies of ours, and ours being autistic bodies. <laughs> it's like the whole thing with that, you know. You t- you treat one ailment, and that drug comes with side uh-huh. effects, and then you yeah. treat the individual side effects, and they have the yeah. branching out. Yeah. <laughs> Which that you know that's actually so. I've been saying I think medications can be really helpful, especially because yeah. it can help offset risk of substances. But it's also not great for everyone for these reasons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the, another treatment, I would say biofeedback, I actually think mm-hmm. autistic people tend to respond really well to because it makes something abstract, concrete. So it's in, there's different kinds of biofeedback, but like one might be you're hooked up to a monitor and you can, you can actually see like your nervous system activation, your breath rate, okay, like ECG. these different measures. Yeah. And then you see yourself calming your body and that's really empowering and and that again with PTSD, it's it's that like overreactivity. Mm-hmm. So biofeedback um, can be and other body based interventions that aren't medication. I is not widely popular, but I'm a safe and sound provider, um, and it's a vagal nerve stimulator. I love it. I've done it on myself. I've I've done it with several clients. Yeah, it's the vagal nerves. It's the parasympathetic. Mm-hmm. Yep. The base. Yep. Yeah, I'd be mm-hmm. really interested in knowing more. Oh, yeah. Wow. So there's body based and they're like every year we're coming out with more. There's body based interventions that aren't medication but also aren't talk therapy. So if you're struggling with these two, there's this like kind of somatic body based biofeedback world. 
that I think can also be really supportive for autistic people with PTSD. Well, I, th- I think I will definitely have a, a little bit more look into that. I, I have had one experience with biofeedback and it was uh, at my university, they had like these little sensory pods that you could go into mm-hmm. and they had these, e- well, it's kind of like a band. It's sort of supposed to do the same thing as needs to use, like checking your brain waves and stuff. And the exercise was to meditate. And the more that you thought mm, about mm-hmm. things, the more like stormy the weather would become in your ears. And the more that mm. you calm down and stop thinking about mm-hmm. things, it started mm-hmm. to become like, yeah, you yeah. hear like sound of birds, and yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> that was really really helpful for, mm-hmm. for for particularly for meditation and sort of centering myself a bit more, definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I know I know we've been talking for quite a while. Uh, there was one last thing, and I know we've, we mm. have also talked about sort of those difficulties with mental health practitioners providers not really understanding autism on its own but what about the really key things Mm -hmm. for any mental health providers out there to take away around sort of the overlap between ptsd and autism yeah so if there were a few things that i really wish mental health providers understood one that even if the person doesn't meet criteria a they might still have ptsd yeah. and that goes back to Big what one. we're talking about mm. that maybe there's not this really concrete trauma to point to but still treat the ptsd if they're having like all of the other ptsd symptoms so so yes that's one two I think understanding the nervous system piece of like having more reactive nervous systems. So doing a lot of education, grounding, like training of the nervous system to get back into a regulated space. I think that's pretty integral to PTSD treatment. Understanding that we're victimized at higher rates, I think is a really important part of understanding the intersection and knowing how to work with that. And then the fourth thing is not attributing everything to trauma. I have met so many people, more women and gender queer people than men, but this certainly happens with men too, where their autistic traits are dismissed because of the trauma. So it's like, Mm. no, that's trauma. And then they're getting treatment for PTSD, but their underlying neurology is being missed. So they're not recovering in the same way. And I think, so just the avoidance of kind of that confirmation bias that this is trauma and actually considering that it might be both autism and trauma is something I wish more therapists did. I I often hear autism and ADHD dismissed because there's trauma. Yeah. When it's, it can often be a both and. And that sort of crossover is very difficult, isn't it? To kind of tease out i suppose there needs to be quite a long process like with anything like that i mean i know the way that the uk that that my sort of medical system works is that i have to identify whether there is something wrong with me and then i go to a specialist Mm. who specializes in that exact thing there's no sort of like middleman that i can go to and say Mm. i'm struggling what have i got like (laughs) can we talk through like what may be Mm -hmm. happening here uh, because sure, the, the knowledge sure. that GPs have, it's so, you know, they have a lot of knowledge mm-hmm. and practical experience and and all mm-hmm. that, but they're very busy and they also mm-hmm. specialize in certain areas. And a lot of the time, they don't really understand autism that much, mm-hmm. um, apart from sort of the stereotypical presentations. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sort of awareness of things like, as I said, alexithymia and... and mm-hmm different things like it's it's sometimes really 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 complex because she's like i don't want to keep going for different diagnoses to try and to, find yeah. out i just want to go to one person and just like uh-huh absolutely and like, um, yeah yeah well because it's it all intersects and so if you're going to like this for like this for ptsd this for autism but like it because it's all compounding and mm. so yeah that, that reminds me, that'd be the other thing I wish mental health providers would understand is alexithymia and that 
don't don't okay. if you have a client with PTSD and autism, don't go off of their facial expressions for trying to like figure out how much stress they're under and know that they're a very elevated risk for suicide. Our baseline suicide risk is way higher. It's PTSD ridiculous. and suicide risk is higher. It is ridiculous. So you're throwing in PTSD and autism, have your eye out for, for suicidality and don't base it off of, are they crying? Like mm. ask the person. For side for me, I, I never cry. I, well, I hardly ever yeah. cry. And I definitely yeah, don't cry when I'm feeling very, very depressed. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, it's, right. It is. It so is when really we're emotionally hard. dysregulated, mm. we, we might not look to a therapist mm. like we're emotionally dysregulated. Because it's not like this. And then this we can get missed. Factual, concrete sort of interaction mm. is that you, you input what's happening, they output what's happening. There's, mm -hmm. like a, there's a conversation. There's a mm -hmm. interpersonal understanding is trying to understand their emotions, but mm -hmm. they forget about the autism and the alexithymia. And, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes they overlook that. And like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, you, it's, it's a classic example. You go into a doctor's, I'm in extreme pain and you, mm -hmm. you don't look like you're in extreme pain. And like, oh, okay, well, right. we're going to sort it out. But if you went in screaming and kicking and just like, oh my God, I'm right. in so much pain. Yeah. like, uh, Jesus, I, I, I excruciate. Uh -huh. And they're like, right, we'll get you to the ER. We'll get mm -hmm, you, we'll get mm -hmm. you sorted out. Absolutely. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. That, that's a great metaphor. And the same thing happens in mental health all the time because we don't like show our psychic pain mm -hmm. in the same way all the yeah. time. You say, yeah. I'm really depressed. I'm thinking mm -hmm. about suicide all the time. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so anxious. I can't function. I look like I can. Yeah. And my friends mm -hmm. don't really take me seriously. And Mm -hmm. Now you don't take me seriously. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's, Thomas, that's a great example of how to advocate. So for the people listening who are clients, it's a great example of how to advocate mm -hmm. for yourself with your therapist of say, say where you're struggling, mm -hmm. make mm -hmm. it explicit and say, I know I might not look like this. This is part of the autism and, and make it explicit. That's yeah. such a powerful way to self-advocate. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I suppose you need, you need some kind of, basis in order to help them understand a certain thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially if it's not fitting into sort of the basic sort mm -hmm. of the um neurotypical neurotypes yeah 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 definitely well it's it's been absolutely amazing to to chat to you and would like to talk more um definitely mm -hmm. uh Sa same this this time has flown it has, it has definitely. This is a sign of a good podcast, I would say. Mm. Um, oh, good. So what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do a uh, song of the day. Mm. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what your song of the day was? I it do. Was? Yeah, it was Green Day, Boulevard of Broken Dreams. When I was Hello. recovering from PTSD, I would walk around Princeton at night. Like walking around at night has always been really soothing for me <laughs> me too yeah. um especially in the rain and i would really <laughs> yeah same back, same and i would listen to that song on repeat it was my stim song and i think it just it captured something that i couldn't quite articulate but i probably listened to that song on repeat for like a year or two when i had ptsd and when i was recovering mm -hmm. from ptsd mm -hmm. that's really so really that's why good. i chose it i mean amazing song anyway great addition to the mm -hmm. 40 OT podcast playlist, uh, song of the day playlist, as you can, you can always find it down in the description just for anybody listening. I don't, just, don't know why I say if anybody's listening, because the people who are listening <laughs> would only be are able to listening. hear me say that. And then the people who it's aren't like listening. It's like if a tree so. falls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, um, I guess, you know, We've 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 gone through. We've we've looked at PTSD. We've looked at sort of the herbal wards some some of the difficulties in sort of therapy. Some of the things that people can do to help. You know, um, some of the ways that 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 might be supportive for for autistic people struggling with PTSD, um, and also uh, some of the things that you know mental health practitioners should be should be really aware of. It's been great to talk to you, and. I guess what I want to ask now is, have you enjoyed the episode? Have you enjoyed the 40-40 experience? 
I have. I very much so. I've been looking forward to this conversation and it's it's kind of what I imagined it would be. I and I like that we were able to go on some neurodivergent or divergent like rabbit trails, but then you you brought us back to the linear path <laughs> that was yeah. our agenda. So it felt very neurodivergent in that way, which I always love those conversations the most. So thank you. Where thank can you people find me. you? They can find me on Instagram, Neurodivergent Insights, on my website, www.neurodivergentinsights.com. I have a Patreon. I make workbooks every month around like wellness and mm-hmm. mental health. So like I just did one on alexithymia sure. recently and um, so Patreon as well. Um, those are probably the top three places. Mm-hmm. And I, I definitely encourage you, if, if anything at least, go and follow uh, Megan over on on Instagram, Neurodivergent Insights. Um, absolutely amazing resource for me, especially when trying to sort of understand both myself, sort of the the crossover between things, and also, you know, understanding sort of the the broader complexity of it all, and you know, the the fact that you know research and understanding is still still growing and it's still. Things, th- things are changing. Things, things are being learned very, very slowly as as we humans do. But there are some, you know, great people like Megan who are sort of heading sort of our our awareness of of, of different things, specifically uh, around the stuff around mis- misdiagnosis. I think was was really impactful on me. So if you have enjoyed this episode and you want to hear more of it, I have a playlist of you know upwards of thirty plus songs. Season one and two. Um, season one, it's a little bit on the the new co- the new coming podcasting style. It's not very well produced or presented, but um, definitely go check out some of the more recent episodes of season two and season one. Head of you can find the Forty Forty podcast, of course, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and of course on my YouTube channel, Thomas Henley, uh, under the Forty Forty podcast. All the video versions are available on there. And yeah, if you want to check out all of the other work that I do, head over to my social medias, particularly my Instagram at Thomas Henley UK. And if you want to get in contact about workplace training, public speaking events, interviews, uh, modeling, get in contact with me uh, via my website, www. I hate doing that. ThomasHenley.co.uk and um, go through the contact form on that. I think that's everything. Been been like a, a bit over a month since I've done the podcast. So I'm hmm. trying to remember exactly what. The muscle memory. The muscle memory is gone. <laughs> yeah. It's like, a li- it's like a little social script, but just like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. with the facial totally. expressions and the body language. But, um, yep. Yep. Well, thank you so much, Megan, for coming on. And Absolutely. I, I did really enjoy this conversation. A great awesome. deal. And uh, for me, I hope you all have a very, very lovely day. <laughs>